You know, not all sermons are preached with words. I remember going to a Good Friday service in a church not of this denomination, and the pastor's uh, Good Friday sermon was something like this. Consider, he pointed at the cross, and he pointed the crown of thorns, and he wept. And then he pointed to his pierced hands, and the pastor wept. The pastor's not saying anything. It's a sermon without words. And then he went to the foot of the cross and pointed out his pierced feet. And finally, he went to the side of Jesus and pointed out the spear that pierced his side. I was moved. The pastor said maybe 15 words during that 10-minute period. And I mean, he wept and he cried and he was distraught. And I said to myself, wow, that is powerful. The rest of the story, however, is uh, several weeks later, I had an appointment with this pastor to talk to him, and I said, that was an amazing sermon that you gave Good Friday about Christ's death on our behalf. And he goes, well, I wasn't trying to communicate Christ's death on our behalf. I was trying to generate sympathy that such an innocent man should die at the hands of uh, unjust Roman authorities and unjust Jewish authorities. And he went on to explain that he did not believe in the death of Christ in our place at all. And so I said to him, I said, well, how are you able to point to that cross and, and weep uncontrollably? And he said, a uh, bachelor's degree in drama at Notre Dame. And as I read this passage we're going to look at this morning, and I thank God for our worship team that set the mood for what I'm going to share this morning. In the passage we're going to look at this morning, we're going to see that the daughters of Jerusalem were very similar to the pastor, although he generated sympathy for Christ, he really never generated any repentance for Christ. So here in this message, we'll look at the priority of the cross. The priority of the cross is such that uh, D.L. Moody once said, if you started eliminating doctrines from the gospel, the last doctrine that you would want to eliminate would be the doctrine of the cross. And I had always thought, well, it's the doctrine of the resurrection. But the resurrection is sort of the proof in the pudding. The message is really the cross of Christ that he died in our place for our sins. And if you look at the outline on the back of your bulletin, in the events surrounding the cross, how did Christ clarify his identity? In verses 27 and 28, there were following him, Jesus, a great multitude of people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus turned to them and said, now these women are mourning and lamenting the fact that Jesus is going to the cross. And Jesus said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me. Now that's sort of an odd request. Don't weep for me. Stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Behold, the days are coming when they will say, blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. For they'll begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. So, not everyone who cries about the cross of Christ comprehends its meaning. Here, the daughters of Jerusalem were very sympathetic to the fact that the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities were unjustly crucifying this man, Jesus, who went around Jerusalem teaching good things and healing people and doing good things. The daughters of Jerusalem, the, the ladies of Jerusalem, understood Jesus was innocent and what a travesty this was. Be, it was a travesty, but believing Jesus was the victim of a strategy is absolutely incorrect because Jesus chose to go to the cross. His death on the cross 
had been planned from Genesis. This was no accident whatsoever. The passage starts out here, and following him was a great multitude. How great was it? Well, there was the accusing multitude, the daughters of Jerusalem, probably representatives of both Pilate and Herod, the murderous Barabbas, the cross-bearing Simon, the three Marys, the apostle John, common crooks, sneering rulers, mocking soldiers, a believing thief, a believing centurion, uh, his relatives, religious authorities. Now listen, and you and me, if we had been there in the Jerusalem in that first century, we would have been in the sneering crowd. Because you know what? We're so self-righteous. And I tell you, pastors are probably guilty of being more self-righteous than most of their members. I devote my life to the study of the Word and prayer. I devote my life to helping people. But those things, although they're important and they're what a pastor should do, doesn't get me into heaven. You don't get into heaven because you're goody two-shoes, Robert Righteous, and Holy Harriet. That does not do it. What gets you into heaven is the cross of Jesus Christ. A hundred percent of this multitude needed forgiveness. And Satan had so many lies that were surrounding the cross of Christ. There was the lie of, I have sinned too much. And this was probably the unrepentant thief. You know, I'm I'm going to hell and it won't be bad. I'll be down there shaking hands with all my friends kind of mentality. And there were the despairing relatives and disciples who said, and we thought Jesus was coming into Jerusalem to take over and in fact he's going to die. And they're, they're having their doubts and especially the disciples who thought he was going to give them the kingdom. There was also the people who were feeling like that they did not deserve the love of Jesus. Do you ever feel that way? You say to yourself, boy, given the sins I have committed recently, why should Jesus love me? Well, let me tell you, it's not by works of righteousness which you have done, but by his grace that he saved you. People at the cross believe Satan's lies, and what lie is keeping you away from Jesus Christ? Unless you identify with the screaming crowd that said, crucify, crucify him, you have not yet come to grips with the depth of your own sin. You have basically uh, ignored the centrality of the cross. When Christ went to the cross, it was our sins that took him there. It wasn't the religious authorities. It wasn't the maddening crowd. It was our sins as well. This uh, uh, thing of where Christ tells the daughters of Jerusalem, now the, he specific, specifically says Jerusalem. It certainly wasn't the women of Bethany, which is uh, east of Jerusalem, because those women all accepted Jesus Christ as Messiah. Certainly wasn't the uh, Jesus of uh, Jude, uh, not Judea, uh, northern Israel, where they accepted Jesus as Messiah. It was the daughters of Jerusalem, who their acquaintance was watching him do miracles and listen to him teaching. And he tells them that they're better off being barren than childbearing. Now, in the first century, having a child was considered a blessing. Dare I say that's even true today, that having a child is a blessing. Christ reverses the paradigm and says, you're blessed if you don't have children. Why would that be? Because a coming judgment in 70 AD in which uh, Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Roman armies and the brutality which is recorded in history against women and their children was, was uh, atrocious, brutal, endless uh, torture and death. There was a historical fulfillment of this in 70 AD, and I believe there is yet to be another fulfillment when Christ comes back to Jerusalem, at what point we do not know. Israel not only lost Jerusalem as the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, they were scattered among the nations. And still today, think about this, there are approximately 7, 000, 7 million 
Jews living in Israel. There's approximately 7.6 million Jews living in the United States. I would call that a scattering, which is still true today. Although if you go back and study how Israel was reformed as a nation in 1948, there's, not a miracle, there's another miracle there which I don't have time to go into this morning. Before we see the cross as something for us, we must see ourselves as something in need of the cross. Christ understood that we would resist surrendering our goodness. This is the number one barrier to the gospel as you talk to people, and Paul Little talks about it in his book, how that most people think they are good enough if God grades on a scale and 51% gets you into heaven, they believe that they're good enough to go to heaven, especially since they're better than those hypocritical Baptists down at Laurelwood Church. And if you talk to many people about Christ, that's exactly the attitude you find because they have been deceived by Satan into thinking that good works get you into heaven. Well, good works are important. We were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. They are important. But the best work you ever did does not get you into heaven. Only the death of Jesus Christ in your place. That's what it says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And when you were dead in your trespasses, Jesus made you alive together with him, having forgiven all of our transgressions at the cross, consisting of a debt of decrees against us. In other words, our moral failure has resulted in a list of decrees against us. And I'm horrified to think about how, list, how long my list might be. You'd have to evaluate your own list. But at the cross, Christ has taken that decree of certificates against us out of the way, having nailed our moral debt to the cross. Now that is a promise. That is a promise. The innocent Christ on a criminal's cross. The daughters of Jerusalem weeping, but weeping out of sympathy. Not tears of repentance, but tears of feeling sorry for Jesus, as if we need to feel sorry for Jesus. The Hebrews chapter 12 says, because of the joy, or 13, because of the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. Christ was able to look beyond to the cross to the joy that he would have as a result of his death in our place. Not a martyr. Let me read three or four verses that show that Christ was not a martyr. John 10, verse 17, I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life, voluntary action. John 12, 27, I came for this hour. Jesus Christ knew he was going to the cross and had planned for it. Luke writes, the cross is Luke Acts 2, 23, the cross was according to the counsel and foreknowledge of God. So the cross is no accident. Christ was not a martyr. He voluntarily went to the cross to pay for our sins. Now you can see why people would have a lot of sympathy for Christ's death on the cross. Several years ago, uh, this movie came out, The Passion. And what my church did, we bought up the entire theater. And we had a showing in which if a member of the church brought a unchurched or dechurched person, we would pay for both tickets. And so we had a great crowd there in the Passion. And we worked it out with a theater where I could have an invitation to receive Christ after the movie. And I have some reservations about that in retrospect, but we won't go into that. But this happened. I, I stood up at the end of the Passion. The, uh, the theater provided me a mic so I know that everyone could hear what I had to say. And I preached a mini gospel message. And I said, if you'd like to come forward today, we'd like to give you a Bible and like to give you some information about what does it mean to follow Christ. Well, I don't know, about a dozen people came forward. 
And we had counselors lined up who worked with each one of those 12, and I likewise counseled a lady. So uh, I had my sinner's prayer with me here, which says, uh, today I'm inviting Jesus Christ into my life to lead my life, to help me follow him and become all that God wants me to be. And so I had the lady read this prayer, and I said to her, do you want to pray that, pray that prayer this evening? It was a Sunday night performance. And she says to me, why the blank would I want to do that? In other words, even though I had watched her during the movie, she had wept off and on during the movie. She saw the innocent death of Christ in the movie having no relevance to her daily life. And she was only sympathetic to the unjust death that Jesus died, wanted no part of having Jesus in her life and following him. This is a danger that we all face. You see, if I can crank up my sympathy for Christ, I must be a good Christian. Christ said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Uh-oh. You mean my sympathy doesn't wipe out my need to follow Jesus? <laughs> it does not. We need to recognize that the gospel has to do with Christ's death in your place. Christ urged people not to focus upon his unjust pain, but upon their need for forgiveness. And then Christ clarifies the necessity of the cross in verses 23 and 24. Two others also who are criminals were being led away to be put to death with Christ. They came to the place called the skull, and there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. By the way, the center cross was always reserved for the greatest criminal. And so Jesus is in the middle cross as the greatest criminal. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast up lots and dividing his garments among themselves. And this Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, is an imperfect tense, which means that Jesus said, forgive them, they know not what they're doing several times during the journey to the cross and on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Not a martyr. Christ was planned to die on the cross from the beginning of the world. Christ's death on the cross is only half the story. The resurrection is the second half. But I find Christ's death on the cross in my place to be far more compelling than the resurrection. The resurrection, a bona fide, greatest historical miracle of all history, true. But what made a difference for me is he died in my place. And he died for my sins, not because he was a martyr. Christ endured our hell that we might enter his heaven. The key verse, I think, here in this section is verse 33. Luke 23, verse 33. And there they crucified him. Just stark reality. There's another misconception that the greatest part of Christ's death on the cross was his physical pain. And the physical pain was great because uh, the only way you could breathe would be to use your feet to stand up and, and that would be more pain. And mo ultimately, most people who died on a cross died of a fixation because they, they could no longer bear the pain of lifting themselves up. But there's a tendency on our part to focus upon the pain of the cross when 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that Christ was made sin for us. That was the greatest pain on the cross to Jesus Christ. I mean, after all, during that first century, Rome crucified thousands of people. So the pain endured on the cross was experienced by thousands of other people in the first century. But what none of those people experienced 
was becoming sin when Christ was absolutely holy and sinless, he bore the emotional, psychological fact of what pain I and mean, what sin meant. And this is why he says, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? For God cannot have fellowship with sin, and Christ became sin. Do you realize the greatest pain on the cross was not his physical sin, but the emotional, psychological sin of bearing your sin and mine? Embracing our sin in the sense that he understood for the first time what sin was like and took it for us. And there they crucified him. I don't pretend to understand the bloody reality of the cross, but I marvel at God's love that he would send his only son to die in my place. Now, there's a great movement today for seeker-friendly churches, user-friendly churches, courtesy churches. And by the way, I'm for a lot of that when we have allowed our cultural Christianity to invade the church where the Bible has nothing to say. We use Christian jargon, not in the Bible. We have worship traditions, not in the Bible. And, that, and, and, and if those things unnecessarily alienate people, we, we ought to delete them. But we cannot delete the cross. This is something that can never leave a worship experience in a church because that is the only way of salvation. Sometimes in a user-friendly environment, you start to get the opinion because we're good people. I mean, I, I bet I have heard mm, 20 conversations at Laurelwood talking about what a loving, supportive group of good people attend here at Laurelwood. Now, on a comparative righteousness basis, I believe that's probably true. But that's not what gets us to heaven. What does? 1 Corinthians 15, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it's the power of God. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs. Greek look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and foolishness to the Gentiles. It is alleged in the Vatican that they have an actual piece of the wooden cross that Jesus Christ died on. And they estimate that if they were put up for public auction, that alleged piece of the cross would sell for multiple millions. I don't know if it's a piece of the wood from the cross or not. But Christ could have died on any tree. Christ could have died on any cross. It wasn't the wooden cross that made the difference. It's who died on it and why he died and his identity where he identified with us even though he was God in the flesh. And when it comes to the death of Jesus on the cross in our place, you ignore it, which means you die in sin, or you embrace it, which means you die free from the penalty of sin. Why did they crucify him? This, this is a mystery to me. Certainly part of it was ignorance. I mean, I think, speculation, that when... Uh, Pilate asked, uh, who do you want to be released today, Jesus or Barabbas? There was a lot of bribed people in the audience who were uh, to say Barabbas because the rel religious leadership did not want Jesus released. So ignorance was part of it. Indifference was part of it. I mean, after all, the Roman soldiers are uh, gambling for the garments of Christ, and that's because to them... Jesus, another Jewish crook. That was their attitude. So there was indifference on the part of some people, ignorance on the part of some people, but mostly it was pride. The people who articulated the opposition to Jesus were the Pharisees, the scribes, the priests, the Sadducees, uh, some of whom uh, estimates about 5% became Christians after the resurrection. Now, why was it only 5% and not 95%? Well, 
The reason has to do with the mentality of the Pharisees. You couldn't even teach in the synagogue until you were 30, so Jesus was barely old enough to teach in the synagogue when he began his ministry. And the Pharisees' attitude, this is a cumulative opinion, was something like this. Why should we let this 33-year-old whippersnapper tell us what our religion says to do? In other words, it was their pride that kept them back from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And pride is what keeps most people back. I'm good enough, especially better than those hypocritical Christians. But see, good enough is not going to make it. Based upon goodness, only one is good. In one sense, there's only been one true Christian. Jesus Christ was the only true Christian because every single person here has fallen short of that standard set by Jesus Christ. Therefore, our only option is to throw ourselves upon the grace of Jesus Christ for forgiveness, for there is no other way. 33-year-old whippersnapper was the attitude of pride. This last paragraph is almost self-explanatory where Christ calls for an immediate response to the gospel. This is verses 35 through 43. The people stood by and even the rulers were sneering at him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. If this be the Christ of God, his chosen one, the soldiers mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now, there was also an inscription above him, this is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who hanged there was hurling abuse at Jesus, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other one answered and rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since we're in the same sentence of condemnation? For we indeed justly were receiving what we deserve for our deeds. In other words, I'm a sinner. First step in repentance. You don't offer God your goodness and your righteousness. You offer him your evil deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong, the innocence of Jesus Christ. And the thief was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He recognized the messianic role of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, you shall be with me in paradise. There is a possibility that only this uh, second criminal on the cross and the Roman centurion who said, this truly is a son of God, are the only two people that became Christians that day. I think you can pretty much demonstrate that some of the, even the disciples didn't believe until after the resurrection. Where are you today? Do you, do you understand that you cannot offer your goodness to God to go to heaven. That's so hard for us to accept. I work hard at being a Christian. I pray. I study the Bible. I witness. I give my tithe. I'm so good. Well, wait a minute. Uh, the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You, me, the Pope, Franklin Graham, and the list goes on. We are all sinners. And our only hope is our Savior, Jesus Christ. As the thief did, he threw himself on the mercy of Christ. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Are you ready to say to Jesus, remember me, Lord Jesus? In your outline, in, excuse me, in your, in your bulletin this morning is an outline called ABC on page 2 of the bulletin, which tells you the steps of action that you need to take to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, for those of you online, uh, heavenornot.net is an excellent website in which you can find the steps you need to take to establish a personal relationship with God, not based upon you're good enough, you'll never be good enough, based solely upon the fact that Christ was good enough to pay your sin debt by giving his moral perfection to you as a gift. 
Let's look to the Lord in prayer.